Hello, my name is John Osborne. I'm a high school teacher in Philadelphia. On March 25th of 2015, I spoke at Eastern University. I broke down during the talk because earlier in the day I had given a eulogy for a student of mine. If you're a high school teacher and are interested in better serving the needs of your students, I think you should watch this video. Thank you. So, my name is Jonathan Osborne. I am a history special education teacher at Alany Charter High School in North Philly. Um, and I have a presentation tonight called You as the Unknown Variable and talking about using empathy to impact student achievement. So before I get into my talk, I, uh, I have a little activity I'd like you to engage in. Um, in high school, if you had a 3.7 or higher GPA, if you were an A student in high school, uh, please stand up. Okay, well done. All right, if you had a 3.4, stay up please, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you had a 3.4 to 3.6 GPA, please stand up. Okay. If you had above a 3.0, please stand up. So as you look around, almost everybody in here is standing up. You're high achievers. You can have a seat now. Uh, my GPA, when I dropped out of high school, was 0 0.4, which is not good. Um, and here I am, about the time I dropped out of high school. It's the 1980s. It was, uh, you know, the bangs were... The bangs were in. Um, and, you know, my experience is much different than your average high school teacher. Um, and that's part of the reason I I'm here to talk to you. I always struggled in school. Um, from, from kindergarten on, school was always a struggle. Um, in middle school, when adolescence came around, school got much, much more difficult. And I went from like a margin, like a C student to a D, F student. Uh, I failed the seventh grade. Uh, and there's, you know, nothing like a little middle school embarrassment. There was a little rhyme that went around. My name is John, I sit in the shade. That's why I failed the seventh grade. Uh, it was good for the self-esteem. Um, I eventually did get through middle school because at some point you age out. <laughs> and. Uh, I went into high school where uh, I continued to struggle and my attendance got worse because at my high school going to class was fairly optional um, and it was bad in ninth grade. I didn't quite pass the ninth grade even with the help of summer school. Um, and then in 10th grade I started to go to school even less. But I, I was really lucky in 10th grade. Uh, I was taking a history class, and towards the end of the year, we got a student teacher in there. And one of the first things we were supposed to do when she was in the class was there was a, a paper we were supposed to turn in, a five-page paper. And uh, it was a rough draft due one day, and uh, I had written one sentence and thought, like, no, I'm probably not going to turn this in. And... Um, the next day, she comes up to me and she goes, Jonathan, are, uh, are you going to do the paper? Do you, do you have anything? And I just sort of shrugged, like, I, I don't know if I'll do it. And she said, look, how about if you write me one page? Write me one page. And, you know, it's kind of like, well, I thought it was supposed to be five. And she's like, look, don't worry about it. Write me one page. Write me one page. So I'm like, oh, okay, I can write one page. Um... And I, you know, two days later, I turned that in, and she asked, okay, can you, can you give me another page? And I ended up writing, you know, about three pages of the five pages. Um, now, some people might say, well, isn't that lowered expectations? And as a special education teacher, I'm also a case manager. So at any given time, I have about 16 or 17 kids on my caseload. Um, and if they're failing a class, part of my job is to go and talk to the teacher that uh, they're struggling with and find out what's going on. 
And what I hear an awful lot of is your student is here and my expectations are here. And that gap is what I call the empathy gap. Now, if you've studied uh, urban education at all, you're all familiar with the achievement gap. Um, but this is the gap I see a lot in school. Now, obviously, teaching in North Philly, uh, the achievement gap is with us a lot. But I just hear that like, ah, you know, I'm here and they're there. And what that teacher did for me, that student teacher did, is she took this and this and she turned it on its side. So it wasn't the teacher up here and I was down here. She turned it on her side. And she came here. And when she came here, I, you know, it seemed to me like, oh yeah, I, I, I can write a couple pages. And we met halfway. And that's not lowering expectations. She got more work out of me than otherwise would have happened. Um, so she continues, and I buy into her at this point. Like I connect with her, and you know we get towards the end of the the end of the marking period, the fourth marking period. And if you're a borderline student, the fourth marking period is very important because you usually have to get a C or a D to pass the class for the year. And we get to the end of the marking period, and I did get a C that marking period, which was pretty good for me. Um, but we also had a final exam. And she did these games to get us ready for the exam. And uh, it was a portion of history where you go from Napoleonic Wars to uh, World War II. And it's all very cause and effect. And, you know, I just was getting it. I was playing these games, real engaged. And the, you know, after the last day of school, I walked to my school to get my report card. And I had gotten an A on the final exam. I'm walking out of the school and... The, the co-teacher that the student teacher had been working with stops me, Mr. Warner. And he says, Jonathan, I, I want you to know, you know, I gave the same exam to the college prep kids. I was a college prep student and the honor student. And you're the only student that got a perfect score on it. Like you have... <laughs> Excuse me. Um, when I get to the end, I'll explain what's going on. But... Um, He's like, you have potential. You could study history if you wanted to. And I'm recommending you get put into an honors class next year. This isn't even the emotional part, by the way. Um, and in the Hollywood story, like, this is where you get happily ever after. Like, I figure out what I can do. I do much better my junior year. Unfortunately, that student teacher and the co-teacher weren't my teachers anymore and my junior year my attendance got worse and worse um, after two marking periods I'd gotten straight F's in 1D um, and you know the thing is like nobody plans to drop out of high school in my experience um, you talk to kids the first day of school every year every kid wants to do better than the year before um, and my attendance got worse and worse, and no teachers talked to me. Like, nobody, you know, stopped to ask me what was going on. And if they had, they would have known, like, I was struggling outside of school. Um, I was being bullied inside school. I was being called a faggot every day. And that's where, like, that gap comes in again. Because you have a bunch of teachers who did excellent in high school. They did excellent in college. And they don't they just didn't quite get this student who wasn't coming to school very often. Um, now when I teach, you know, you know, I see those kids and I stop and I ask them, what's going on? Why aren't you coming to school? One of the last days I did go to my high school, you know, I went to a class, it was first period. And, you know, I never passed a first period class in high school. And I walk in and the, and the teacher's like, oh, Mr. Osborne's here. Thank you for coming to class. And I never went to that class again. And pretty soon I wasn't going to any classes. Um, you know, when you have a student that's not coming to school often, don't mock them for, for coming to school. Um, incentivize them coming to school. I'm glad you're here. Come tomorrow. Let's make it two days in a row. Let's build success, not mock the fact that they're not coming to school, that I wasn't coming to school. 
And no one really asked what was going on with me until it was too late. Uh, the last day I went to school, uh, it was about this time of the year. This is the time of the year, spring, where students start to drop. Uh, if they have bombed the first two marking periods, the third marking period is kind of the last chance to get it all together. Um, and I went into school and an administrator saw me. So we, we need to talk, let's come in here. So we went in and he asked me what was going on and I told him I had gotten into a huge fight with my parents. Uh, they found out that I was cutting school to go skiing every day. Uh, I did end up becoming a professional skier, so that had some value, I guess. Um, and this is, this is, so the problem is I'm not going to school. And he said, this is gonna sound crazy, but the last time you were here, you were late for a class, and that triggered an amount of apps, amount of lates that triggered a suspension. So I finally come to school, and I get sent home. Um, and I don't blame the administrator. And by the way, I don't blame the school. I made choices. They're mine. But when I talk about the unknown variable, my school was the known variable. Me plus my high school equal to dropout. That day the administrator said to me, look, come back tomorrow, we'll sit down with your teachers, figure out if we can get you enough credits to keep you on a four-year track. The next morning, the alarm clock went off and I didn't get up. And about two weeks later, I, I realized, I guess I'm a high school dropout. Now, I was lucky. I had great parents. Uh, they never gave up on me. And I also was lucky to grow up in a, in a really good neighborhood. Um, in my neighborhood, the question wasn't, are you going to graduate from high school? The question was, what are you going to study in college? What are you going to get your college degree in? Um, so I had that going for me. So that, that fall, I went to an adult high school and actually had a, had a really good experience. Uh, took the GED, used that to get 10 credits, and, and I actually graduated with my class. Um, but to go back to my high school, you know, to, to the high school I teach at and the high school I was at, everybody, almost everybody in here stood up. I'm sure everybody here had a better GPA than me when you graduated high school. Uh, and if you didn't, then you have a very unique story that you can use to help your students. Um, but the thing is, you have these high achieving teachers, and I've just seen a lot of teachers give Fs and, it, and without much feeling behind it. And a lot of teachers failed me with what I would say was, was a lot of, without a lot of feeling. And you know, the thing is, like, none of you would accept an F in a class, but we tend to be more accepting of giving a student an F. Now, some students are gonna fail, and especially when you have kids that, you know, attend at like 30, 40 percent rates, you know, I'm not here to tell you to pass every student. But what you should feel whenever you give an F is you should also feel that you're failing a little bit too. And every time, you know, I update my, week, my grades weekly. And every time I put grades in for kids that are struggling and I see them going from the 70s to the 60s to the 50s, it hurts a little bit. And it should. You know, we should have feeling and empathy for the students that are struggling the most. Now, the big criticism of what I'm saying would probably come from people who would say, well, you have low expectations from students. No. I get everything I can out of my students. And if I come here, you know, if we start here and I come here, I'm getting more out of them. That's not lowered expectations. I'm trying to help them see what they are capable of doing. Nobody has ever been inspired by getting an F. No great, you know, story starts with, you know, that teacher gave me an F and wow, I was really inspired and I really changed my life after that teacher told me I failed. Um, we inspire students by making them believe that they are capable of more than they are. Um, and the other thing is the world is going to teach them about what they need to do. I got fired from my first three jobs, you know, one in high school, one and two after high school. 
I was lazy. I didn't get to places on time. And, you know, the free market very quickly showed me what I needed to do just to even hold a job at a country club, you know, as a server. Um... When you teach, there is going to be everything in the world you have no control over. You, but you've got to believe that when you close that classroom door, you are the difference. Um, once again, going back to teaching at Alani, like I have heard stories and helped kids through things that are just heartbreaking, including this week. But once that door closes, you've got to get everything out of them you can. I was taught by a series of people who were mostly kind, competent profess professionals. But there was always a but at the end of every compliment. Jonathan is smart, but he doesn't work hard. Jonathan is a good kid, but he doesn't pay attention. And part of how we take underachieving students and turn them into achieving and maybe overachieving students is by making them believe. And an F is not going to make them believe. Um, I've just had too many conversations with teachers that I'm here, they're here. You can turn that on its side, come here. They will come there. Not all of them, but, you know, and I've, I've taught kids who have dropped out. And Every time it happens, and every time I have, you know, I give a, a student an F. I think about what could I have done differently. The next time a student comes a, into my classroom similar to this one, what can I do? And the thing that I'm asking is, and this is another tough part of teaching, is you're always asked to do a little bit more, especially if you're going into special education. Your only hope is that you become a little more efficient every year and keep up with it. But what I'm asking you to do, like, isn't extra paperwork. It's just connecting with students, encouraging them, making them believe. Um, you never know where they're going to end up. You know, I didn't graduate college until I was 35 years old. Didn't really find a career, a niche, in, until I was 37 years old. When I talk about you being the unknown variable, like, I look back at my high school, if I'd had a couple more teachers like that student teacher, you know, maybe my junior year teach turns out differently. You know, if I have a teacher that's like on me, come to school tomorrow, you can do this. Uh, you close that door, you believe you can do it. And if you believe you can do it, if you have high expectations for your students, and you have empathy, if you can bring empathy and expectations in your classroom, you can change lives. And you will change lives.